Hello, and thank you all for joining us for our presentation on how to avoid traps when selling your home. My name is Julie, and I'm here with our presenters, Eric and Josh. Uh, before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items. All of your lines are muted. Please type any of your questions into the Q&A window provided on the Zoom toolbox. Uh, the chat box will be for any technical difficulties or if you have any comments that you'd like to share with other attendees. Please note that any of your questions will be answered at the end of today's presentation. We are currently sharing our screen and showing our PowerPoint. Please use the chat box to let me know if you cannot see or hear something that we are that we will be showing and I'll be monitoring the chat throughout the session. Um, at the end of today's session, we'll share the PowerPoint slides and the recording. It will also be made available on our website. Finally, let us know how we did by completing a brief survey that will appear at the end of your screen at, um, from the webinar. So let's meet our real estate team. We have Joshua Burzak. He works in the real estate, probate, and trust and estate administration areas. He's also a rising star uh, from Super Lawyer since 2019. We also have partner Eric Einhart, who leads the guardianship department. He is also a National Academy Elder Law uh, Attorney, a board of director for 2021, and he's also the editor in chief of the NALA News. Thank I'd you, like Julie. to have Eric introduce Tommy. Thanks, Julie. So we also have uh, the newest member of the Russo Law Group team, Tommaso Morosco, who before joining the team, Tommaso had a solo practice in the estate planning and real estate uh, practice area. Tommaso, you want to say hello? Hi, everybody. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks a lot. And we're very excited to speak with you today uh, with regards to uh, the process to sell your home. What I'd like to say is we will cover um, a couple of different topics. One, what should you do before putting up the for sale sign? How can you avoid uh, your, your home sale from falling apart? What is the role of the attorney in a real estate transaction? So all of these are the concepts and the topics that we'll be discussing uh, throughout the, uh, the presentation. Next slide. So I guess the first thing is, what should you do before putting up the for sale sign? Now, typically your house is your most valuable asset. So you really wanna make sure you're approaching the process very carefully and thoughtfully, and you wanna take advantage of all the resources that you have at your disposal, um, all the expert opinions and all the, the, uh, the insight that you may have before you actually move forward with the process. Next slide. So things you want to consider before you put up the for sale sign is number one, do you have the necessary documents that it's going to take in order to sell the property? Same may seem like an obvious concept, but you want to make sure you have a copy of the deed or the original deed. If you're selling a co-op or uh, a condominium, you want to make sure that you have the necessary documents that you're going to need in order to transfer the title. Um, so Josh, what kind of documents uh, do you typically see clients uh, needing in order to sell property? Uh, so first and foremost, I would say um, you want at the very least a copy of the uh, last deed of record. Um, the importance of this is so that you understand who has title to the property, as in who owns the property and who has the right to sell it. Um, you can run into some situations where you may believe that um, you have full right to sell it on your own, but there may be somebody else on the deed as well um, who would have some say. Um, other items would be um, what's called a certificate of occupancy. Um, this is a document that is issued by the town buildings department uh, where the property is located. Um, the certificate of occupancy is required for all houses built after a certain year. Um, I believe it's back in the 1940s. Um, I may have to check that. Um, but after that, um, thank you. I'm going to say 1938. Yeah, thanks, Tommaso. Um, so 1938. Um, so if the house is built prior to that, uh, ordinarily a CO will not, or a CO for short, will not be issued. But if it's after that, uh, usually the town buildings department requires a document basically certifying that this building is built for this purpose. Usually when we're talking about uh, residential property, it's what's called a one family dwelling. 
um, maybe a two, one to two family dwelling. Uh, also, you want to make sure that you have what's called certificates of completion. These are for any significant improvements that were made to the property after it was um, built, such as if you added a garage, uh, maybe added a patio, uh, installed a boiler, made a conversion of a garage to a um, to living space. Ordinarily, the uh, town buildings department requires you to get uh, such improvements inspected. Um, you have to open up permits and then have them inspected and then they'll sign off in, on them and issue what's called a certificate of completion. Um, and then importantly, if you are selling the property of a deceased individual or the property has been set into a trust, you just want to have those documents, um, you know, either the will or the trust agreement, not only to educate yourself as to what your responsibilities are, if you are the fiduciary under those documents, um, but also um, who is to receive any proceeds or, or more. Hey Josh, what if you're selling a co-op? What, what do you need for that? Uh, so yeah. co-ops are a little bit different. They, um, they're not actual real property. It's more of stock interest in a cooperative uh, incorporation. Uh, so usually what you'll have is a uh, stock certificate and what's called a proprietary lease. Um, and these documents are ordinarily given to you when you purchase the cooperative unit. Um, and you know, as an attorney, we always recommend that you keep them in a safe space because losing them could ultimately um, put any sale of the apartment in peril. So you need the original? Yes. Okay. Uh, and if you're the nominated executor under the will, um, is that enough or do you need to go through the uh, court proceeding? No, no, you absolutely, As if the owner is, has passed away, you absolutely need to go to uh, the court and probate the will and get appointed as an executor of the decedent's estate. Um, once that occurs, you have the right, at least if the will allows it, to sell the property. Okay. So another thing to consider is retaining a real estate attorney. At, at some point, uh, once you have an accepted offer, you're going to need to have a uh, contract of sale. You're going to need to clear your title. You need to have uh, to, to close on the property. So um, getting in line uh, and an re experienced real estate attorney, I, I think is essential. It may seem like self-serving information, but it, it is important. Uh, would you agree, Josh? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and, a broker's agreement. I think it's good to have a, a real estate broker and you'd want to review the agreement uh, with your attorney uh, before signing anything. Um, what other docu what other th things are there to consider, Josh? Well, uh, permits is another item. I th think we touched briefly on them with the certificate completions, but um, if a, a permit has been opened with regards to an improvement made to the property, um, and it hasn't been closed out, you want to make sure that those permits are closed out um, as soon as possible. Um, with regards to uh, if the property is being currently uh, being leased to a tenant or there's somebody, maybe another family member living in the property, um, you want to consider uh, the time necessary for them to leave if they'll be um, agreeable to leaving, um, that you want to have take into consideration before you even enter into the contract because you don't want to run into a situation where uh, someone's squatting in the house and you're contracted to close on a certain date. Um, you also want to be aware of any potential uh, title issues that may um, pop up. Um, if there may be liens put on the property um, because of any uh, judgments against the homeowner, um, you wanna be cognizant of uh, if you have a, a survey just to take a look at it, um, make sure nothing's been uh, done in the year since the survey was uh, created that would cause a, a possible out of possession issue, which we'll touch upon later. Um, so those are other items to consider. So Josh, if there's a tenant, is that something that you would wanna, and the tenant doesn't seem to be willing to move or interested in leaving, is that something you'd wanna reach out to the attorney about beforehand or, or uh, just try to move forward with the sale? No, I think you definitely need to uh, approach your attorney about this issue because it's extremely important that it is resolved or um, before you close. Um, there are specific attorneys who handle what's called landlord tenant. So while your real estate attorney may not be um, able to help you, they can definitely refer you to another attorney who would be able to help handle uh, any issues with the tenant currently living in the property. That's great. So this is really just a, a way to get all your ducks in a row 
so that you can move forward and have a, a, a smooth transition and, and smooth sale, right? Selling with the uh, sale of property, right? Yes. All right. So next slide, please. All right. So another thing you could you should do before uh, putting up the for sale side is decide whether you're going to try to sell the property on your own or enlist with a broker, a real estate broker. And we've all heard the adage, he who represents himself as a fool for a client, not to call any of you fools, but I think that it's important for this to be a consideration initially. Uh, and there are definitely pros and cons with, um, with retaining a real estate broker. Uh, Josh, what do you see as the pros and the cons in these situations? So I, I think uh, the obvious pro of uh, selling it on your own and not enlisting a broker is you're gonna save money at the end of the day. Um, the seller is commonly um, obligated to pay the brokers the commission from the sale proceeds. Um, currently the market calls for a four to 6% uh, brokerage commission, um, you know, four to 6% of the purchase price. Uh, so if you go on your own, you are effectively saving that money. Uh, you don't have to pay a broker at the end, at the closing uh, for any commissions. Um, now the negative of going on your own, really the positive of having a broker is that um, the broker has obvious expertise in selling properties, it's their job. So uh, they may be able to get you a higher price um, than you may have been able to on your own. They sort of know what the market says, not only uh, in general, but around the area where you're selling. Um, so they have a better idea of what goal to reach for as to a listing price and eventually where to settle. Um, you're also, uh, doing the sale on your own without a broker, I mean, it, it could be extremely time consuming and stressful. Uh, you need to be uh, available to show the house uh, to a multitude of purchasers. Um, and you're also limiting your uh, pool of potential buyers because there are certain um, databases that a broker has access to such as uh, MLSLI, which is a listing uh, database. Uh, so you, they have a farther reach as to the advertising of the house. Um, you know, you also can get uh, expert opinion as to updates and renovations or fixes that need to be made before you sell the property. Um, some properties have a multitude of issues, especially if they're, uh, they've been uh, owned by a homeowner for a, a lengthy uh, bit of time. Um, you know, often I find clients come in saying, well, I have to do this, this, and this to really fix it up. And we always recommend that they talk to a broker because some of these fixes might not have any effect on the eventual sales price or the uh, buyer pool. Um, and you, it's just basically uh, wasting money. Um, yeah, that's great advice. You definitely don't want to put money into something that's not going to come out with a, a net benefit for you, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and some brokers have um, you know, great uh, expertise on this and they can tell you, yeah, this is something that you definitely want to do because this will exponentially increase the price of the, of, of the house. Um, also, you know, if you're an executor or a trustee and there are multiple beneficiaries who are to receive the proceeds, um, having a broker helps you insulate you from, um, you know, potential uh, accusations or litigation from the beneficiaries uh, saying that you undersold the price and you didn't maximize the, uh, the, the, the value of the house. Um, so by, you know, hiring a broker, you're pretty much getting somebody who is an expert on the, uh, in the sale and putting it on the market and getting fair market value, as opposed to maybe selling it to, uh, you know, you see a lot, um, my neighbor's child, uh, wants to buy the house. Um, you may not necessarily, uh, sell it for what you could have sold on the, uh, market. Absolutely. Uh, next slide, please. Oh boy, this kind of reminds me of my house. So prepare, when you prepare to sell your house, um, you want to get ready, your home ready for the sale. You don't want to declutter. So if you're anything like me with um, a bunch of little kids around, you, you want to take care of all the toys, clean up all the toys, uh, make sure you, you have good curb appeal. Uh, you want to stage your, your, your home in, in a, an effective way and listen to your agent. I mean, Josh, any, any experience that you have with working with clients in, in terms of the preparation they do to the physical premises? Um, not particularly. Or ordinarily, we uh, 
we refer back to the agent as to their expertise as to what they believe uh, needs to be done to make the home ready for the sale. Um, you know, this is part of their job. They understand exactly how you want to stage the property to make it more um, uh, attractive exactly. to buyers. Sorry, I couldn't get the word out. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, you definitely want to make the, uh, the, the hedges, the lawn attractive, uh, maybe power washing the house if there's some dirt on it. Just, you know, like, like the uh, list says, curb appeal is very important um, when you're listing the property. I guess that's another reason why it's important to, to make sure you have a broker that can kind of tell you what to focus your efforts on and, and what's going to be helpful, what's not going to be as helpful. So, next slide. So before you accept the offer, uh, you, hopefully you'll get a couple offers and a, a number of them, uh, and you hopefully have a bidding war and, and you, it can drive up the price. But before you accept an offer, there's some things that you, you should be considering. Um, specifically, what type of contract are you getting into? Is this uh, all cash or is there gonna be a mortgage? Uh, is it as is? If it is as is, what does that really mean? Uh, and, and what, specific provisions do you need to have in the contract and you need to have the parties understand before even getting into contract. Uh, so Josh, tell us a little bit about uh, what is considered all cash and, and how does that work with the mortgage? So um, all cash is, as you know, as it says, it's um, the buyer is going to be paying the purchase price. Uh, they have all the funds in cash. They are not going to finance their purchase and obtain a loan from a bank uh, and put use the house as collateral for that loan. Um, so the benefit of an all cash buyer is that ordinarily there's a, uh, it's a quicker timeline to close. Um, you know, if you're looking for that, some people may uh, not want a quicker timeline, but most people do um, because you're not dealing with a third party, namely the lender who is requiring the purchaser to meet uh, certain qualifications in order for them to uh, feel comfortable to uh, fund the mortgage uh, or fund the loan rather. Um, also, uh, all cash buyers, there's more of a workaround with uh, title issues. Um, you know, a lender may or a financer may not, uh, may see some title issues and not feel comfortable funding the loan and request that those issues be resolved. Um, with an all cash buyer, you can be a little more flexible uh, mm -hmm. with regards to uh, the closing. Um, maybe it's reducing uh, the price commensurate to what the issues are or, or whatnot, but you have a lot more flexibility to close. Um, and in that same breath, you know, you're avoiding the third party oversight um, that you have with like a bank and their attorney. I always um, think of all cash as like a, somebody coming into the, uh, an office with a suitcase full of uh, hundred dollar bills. Is that the situation or does it have to be, could it be theoretically a mortgage uh, just with an all cash contract? So um, sometimes there's buyers who um, they enter in a, into a contract all cash, but they have some kind of private um, loan uh, agreement on the side, maybe with a private finance. Uh, like a private family finance. member or something? Yeah. Um, so, you know, for all intents and purposes, they're bringing all cash to the closing, um, not necessarily in a briefcase. Uh, that would kind of make me a little concerned, but um, <laughs> they... Uh, they're getting a, maybe a loan from somebody else on the side and it, it not really a, they're not really using the house as necessarily as collateral. So they're not obligated to, to get a mortgage. It, you, they, you can compel them to close and they can't say, well, we can't get a mortgage so we can't close, right? Correct. Okay, great. Talk a little bit about mortgages. Um, what type of mortgages are out there and, and what should uh, everybody be looking out for? So, I mean, with mortgages, you're usually going to be looking at... Um, a higher purchase price, just simply because somebody um, doesn't necessarily have to have all the cash up front um, out of their own funds, so they can uh, take the bank's loan, pay you, and then pay it off, uh, usually over 15 to 30 years. Um, so you may get a higher price, purchase price, when you're dealing with a buyer who's uh, getting financing. Um, but if you are, you just have to be aware that there's different types of mortgages. Um, Usually the one that everybody thinks about is what's called like a conventional mortgage. Um, but then there's also uh, governmentally insured mortgages like FHA, veterans. Um, the buyer usually is putting less money up front for a down payment or um, 
uh, payment of their own funds at closing, um, but there's more oversight and restrictions uh, from the lender. Uh, most notably, sometimes they uh, require improvements to be made to the house in order for them to agree to fund the loan at closing. Uh, so this can uh, you know, delay the closing and create an issue where uh, some improvements do need to be uh, made. And who's responsible for making those improvements, the cost of that? Well, um, ordinarily in our contracts, we uh, put a provision in the rider that specifically requires uh, the purchaser to pay for those, um, those improvements because ultimately they're the ones who are going to benefit from them once they buy the property. Um, and usually the oversight is that uh, the seller has a right to uh, agree to uh, who is creating, uh, basically uh, implementing those improvements. Uh, so you, you're not having just some uh, guy off the street uh, making those improvements to the house. God forbid something falls through and, you know, they don't do it, do it the correct way. Yeah. So that makes sense to me. So what, what about, but you, you mentioned the, the money up front. Is there a, a, what would you think is the difference between the percentage of a down payment for a government insured uh, mortgage versus a conventional? What could people expect? The common uh, down payment where the buyer puts them up pays a portion of the purchase price at the signing of the contract. I, the custom right now is at 10%. Um, you know, as a firm, we do not agree to go below 5%. That is the lowest we'll go, but um, it's oh, it, we always prefer 10% at closing, 10% uh, at contract, and then 10% at closing. Uh, and that's the preferred. You wanna make sure they have as, uh, as much skin in the game as possible so they, they're serious about uh, buying the premises, right? So talk a little bit about what is as is. It's a common phrase that you hear a lot. So maybe someone uh, thinks they know what it is, but uh, let's let's explain it to them. So I hear a lot from clients um, when they're talking. We're talking about the uh, the offer before we start drafting the contracts. As oh yeah, um, you know I'm selling it as is. Um, so you know they're taking it with all issues. I'm not. I don't have to do anything. Um, that's what the broker told me. And I try to explain to them that that's not necessarily correct. Now, as is, is more about the condition of the property, um, physically and structurally, and about the uh, utilities, and not necessarily uh, with title issues. So um, as is usually is the condition of the property as of the date of the contract, uh, subject to usual wear and tear, um, you know, mother nature and whatnot. But uh, with regards to open issues, violations, uh, as we we're talking about open permits, that's not necessarily um, part of the as is language. So you just need to be aware that um, as is is more of a, about the condition of the property and not necessarily about the overall issues with the property. That's helpful. So if you have a, a situation where you, you need to sell your property, but you're not quite ready to actually physically leave the property. What happens in those situations and, and how do you handle them? So I think you need to be upfront with your attorney uh, immediately about um, any concerns with, uh, you know, what called holdover provisions uh, that you may need. Um, and you could always have the attorney put it in the contract and, and not use it. It's not a mandatory uh, we put in the provision, I have to do, I have to stay beyond the closing. Um, sometimes, you know, you need additional time to move out um, just because of maybe the clutter and you're concerned that you won't necessarily have everything done by the time of closing. Um, a lot of what we see is that uh, sellers are also, they need somewhere to go and live. So they're also in the process of buying the house. Uh, so sometimes the uh, closings for the sale and the purchase don't align. So there may be some uh, period in between where the uh, seller needs to stay in the property until they, uh, they buy the new house. Um, there's also um, the issue with tenants. Um, if they need additional time and they can't get out by closing or um, you know, for younger uh, couples uh, with children in school, um, they might want to hold over uh, to wait until the end of the year or the end of the semester uh, before moving uh, so that their child isn't displaced um, in school. So um, holdover provisions ordinarily are, you know, they're called uh, po usually post-closing possession, um, where the seller and buyer agree that the seller can stay for a certain amount of days after closing, 
Um, and then once those days are over, either the seller has to be out or there's a certain amount per day that they pay to the buyer uh, in order to remain. Um, usually there's also uh, money held in escrow uh, from the sale proceeds so that the uh, buyer has um, some uh, collateral in case any uh, damage is done by the seller uh, in the interim while they're, while they're in the holdover uh, state. Because they don't actually own the home anymore at that point. They're kind of like, uh, you know, tenants to some degree. Correct. Yeah. So, so the bottom line is, I suppose, if you're selling a home and, and uh, you know, you want to get the cash and use that to buy another home, or if you can't leave the home for whatever circumstances, there's a possibility that you could still move forward with the sale. And you just need to be very conscious of that and, and make sure that your attorney is aware and the, the, uh, the potential buyer is aware of that. So there's no, uh, you know, confusion or issues before you go to closing. It's definitely something to, to be transparent about from the beginning, right? Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. How can you avoid your home sale from falling apart? Well, you hire a good lawyer and uh, you take his or her advice. Uh, next slide. There is more to it, sorry. <laughs> uh, so there are some issues that come up whenever you're selling a house and some of them you can kind of control beforehand, some of them you can't, and, um, but you could always address them as they go along. So Josh, just tell us a little bit about some of the issues that can come up when you're selling the home. Uh, so as previously discussed, uh, open permits are a big one that I usually see. Um, you know, the improvements were made to the property that the town code requires uh, permits to be opened and inspected by the town, the buildings department, and then closed. Um, but they, the, per, the work was done and the permits were never, uh, the work was never inspected and the permits were never closed. Um, this can be an issue because if, when the title, when the buyer obtains a title report, the title company will run a search at the buildings department to see what open permits, if any, are on the property. Um, and if these show up, most likely, unless it's contracted before, that they'll accept the property subject to open permits, um, which is usually only with uh, buyers who are looking to maybe knock the house down. So it's more developers. Um, they will ordinarily at request you to either close them before closing uh, or provide them money to accept it subject to those open permits. And if the buyer's getting a mortgage, usually they're not gonna accept uh, some sort of uh, exchange of cash to accept it with the open permits, they're gonna want them closed. So, um, you know, one that I dealt with was, uh, post, there was a uh, property in Long Beach with post uh, Hurricane Sandy repairs and a contractor did all this work to repair the property and he opened all these permits and never closed them. Um, so we, we ran into a situation where, um, we ordinarily refer our clients to an expediter, which is someone who is well versed in the town codes and with the processes to uh, open and close permits. And they had to, we had to delay the closing and enough time for her to close at least most of the permits. Um, in this situation, it was an all cash buyer. So they accepted some of the open permits to be uh, at closing. But um, ultimately, if we had a lender, it, it probably would have been a situation where we had to close all of them. Um, this they, must they, come up often, with, especially with, on being on Long Island after Hurricane Sandy, all the damage it did to a lot of homes. Yes, absolutely. So if you're in a flood zone, it's something to definitely look at um, just because of the damage that was done in, uh, post, you know, during Hurricane Sandy. Um, it, Boundary issues are uh, another big one, specifically out of possession, which is usually encroachments of more than one foot onto your property. Um, so that's if a neighbor builds a fence or puts up a fence um, and they put it uh, over a foot onto the uh, boundary line, you're, you're gonna run into a situation where um, Ordinarily buyers, especially if they're getting a mortgage, have to get updated surveys. And when they do that survey, uh, they're gonna show that the, uh, the fence is over a foot over the line. In this, that case, you either, um, you have a couple of uh, solutions, but they really, um, unless you put up that fence and you're comfortable enough putting the fence back to where it's supposed to be, 
you're going to have need the cooperation of your neighbor and doing what's called either an out of possession affidavit, where they basically say acknowledge that they have no right to that part of the property that they built onto, um, or a boundary line agreement, which um, could get costly because you need to actually record those with the deed. Um, there's open mortgages, which is another big issue that we've found, especially when someone's selling from an estate or trust and the homeowners uh, passed away. Um, sometimes a uh, buyer would have, uh, a homeowner would have paid off their mortgage and either a uh, satisfaction was sent to them and they didn't know that they then needed to record it or um, the bank never recorded the mortgage, satisfaction of mortgage directly. But um, when the buyer's title company runs uh, a title search and the, uh, they, they show any uh, open mortgages on the property, um, at that point, you need to be aware that you're going to have to get those um, satisfied. And if already satisfied, you may have to go through the uh, decedent's uh, personal belongings to see if you can find the original satisfaction. Or if not, the attorney may need to contact the bank or if the bank no longer exists. Uh, whoever took over the, that bank's uh, clientele um, and have them reissue a satisfaction. Um, so that could be a huge issue. Uh, judgments is another one. Um, I just like to let my clients know in advance, the title company for the buyer will also run everybody's names for any open or outstanding judgments, um, but they run names and not necessarily social security numbers. So um, <laughs> when I call them, I say, hey, the judgment came up. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's against them. Um, and we just have to uh, cross-reference whether or not they ever lived at the uh, address that the judgment shows that individual to have lived at the time. And when you say um, judgments, what do you, what do you mean? Like if, if somebody uh, had a creditor and their creditor uh, went to court for them? or Yeah, was that? Uh, 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 any sort of, um, yeah, if, a, if like a, uh, you default on a credit card and uh, the company... Uh, files uh, a claim against you for the money owed um, in court, uh, that will be searched um, to make sure that you're not um, defrauding any creditors. Um, and then if the title company sees that and you are actually the person that, uh, is, that has that judgment against them, uh, the title company will ordinarily require you to either uh, resolve the judgment before closing or if, if they allow it, to hold money uh, at closing in escrow with the title company and then have that money used to pay off the judgment thereafter. Um, so th that's, that's yeah, that, something that comes up. Josh, just to circle back with the boundary issues, is, is that something that you could, the, 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 the seller could address before they, they even get into contract? Is that something they should, they should try to uh, rectify or, or wait till it becomes an issue? Um, it's, it's more so about uh, cost. You can always um, you can always hire a, uh, a surveyor to create a new survey to try and see what the um, whether or not there's any existing uh, encroachments on the property. Mm -hmm. um, that's really the only way that I would say that you would be able to find that out. You can't really tell by uh, <laughs> just by eyesight whether or not there's been any uh, uh, whether they're, they're going to be over the lines because you know there's nothing actually physically showing the boundary lines um, other than on a survey. So if you're be, aware of it, I guess you could knock on your neighbor's door and see if they'd be okay with signing an affidavit or something. Yeah. Or, you know, you could just think back to have my neighbor put up any uh, fences recently. And, you know, since I've lived here, um, you know, are they, uh, that's usually the one that I, I would say you need to think about. Um, because it may be an issue. Sometimes people uh, hire somebody to put up a fence and they don't follow any sort of survey or whatnot and they just put the fence up where they want to put it. So if you have a neighbor who put a fence up, I would say it's something to definitely think about. That's good, good advice. So what if you own a home in a trust? What do you, what do you need to be concerned about there? Well, you just need to make sure that the document uh, that the trust agreement authorizes the sale and that you as the trustee has the power and the necessary consents to sell it. Um, you know, and maybe who is entitled to receive those proceeds or receive the house. Um, so you just want to be clear that you have the right to sell the property before you enter into contract. Um, so if the trust leaves the house to me personally, so I leave, uh, you know, my home at 123 Main Street to Eric, 
uh, you as the trustee couldn't sell that? Um, not without the consent of Eric in that situation. Right. Yeah, I, I don't give you consent, so you can. So no, you no in that situation, no, you're you're not. You can't do it. Um, so you just want to be make sure because if you entered the contract and you don't have the power to sell, uh, you can run into a huge issue there. Um, I would also say you just want to be um, have an established a trust account in advance, so a bank account in the name of the trust, because the proceeds from the sale will be made payable to the trust, and you'll need somewhere to deposit that money. I imagine that that works also for an estate as well. Correct. Yes. Okay. So what if there is um, a life estate on the property? How does, that, how does that work? And how does that impact you if you're trying to sell the house? So if, um, and this goes back to uh, making sure that you have the last deed of record to make sure um, there's no problems with the titling to the property. But if um, somebody holds a life estate in the property, so uh, for instance, um, I trans my, my mother transfers the property to me and my wife with her holding a life estate, that means that she has the right to live in the property despite her not necessarily owning the property for the remainder of her life. Um, in such cases, me and my wife, as long as my mother is still alive or the life estate holder is still alive, we can't sell that property without her also agreeing to sell it. Um, and then if she, knock on wood, hopefully not soon, passes away, um, we would have to provide proof of her passing to um, the buyer's title company so that they're comfortable knowing that uh, the life estate holder is no longer, uh, the life estate has extinguished. So would your mom be entitled to um, some of the sales proceeds if you could sell it? No, she would not. Okay, uh, next slide. So what is the role of the attorney in a real estate transaction? Uh, next slide, please. Well, we're going to, uh, first of all, you got to tell us everything you know about the property ahead of time, just so we know what we're getting into and we could uh, advise you accordingly. Uh, and in doing that, we, we typically like to review the terms of the broker's agreement before you sign that. Um, we also will prepare uh, and handle negotiations for the contract to sale. We will review the title report as it comes in from the buyer and advise regarding the title issues. Uh, we will uh, handle post-closing matters, any issues with occupancy or escrows. Um, and, and Josh, when, when you prepare a contract to sale, is it typical for the buyers to just accept the contract to sale as you propose it, or how does that work? No, typically um, the, uh, the seller's attorney will draft the contract and provide it to the buyer's attorney. Uh, the buyer's attorney will ordinarily make changes um, that they believe are necessary to protect their client and then provide it back to the seller for approval. So there is a uh, stage of negotiations that occur between the attorneys um, until everything is settled. And so the, there's a little bit of back and forth and, and once you settle on a, uh, exact terms, um, but how do you know when uh, an offer is accepted and, and what, what information to, to receive to draft the contract to sell? Is that something that the real estate broker helps you out with? Yeah, so if you have a real estate broker employed, usually the real estate broker will uh, put all the, um, the basic details about the accepted offer in what's called a deal sheet and provide that to the attorneys, both the buyer and the seller, uh, so they're aware. And that's something that the seller can base the drafting of the contract off of. Um, if there's no broker involved, ordinarily it's a discussion with uh, the seller as to what was the agreed upon uh, terms. And that's another benefit is the broker usually has more knowledge as to uh, more terms that are important to agree upon before the contract is uh, drafted. Um, so sometimes you're a little bit uh, drafting the contract a little blind when you're not dealing with the broker. Yeah, and I think it's a good idea. And I think uh, Josh will agree to this too. Once we get the deal sheet and we have the pertinent information that, that, that is communicated to us by the, the broker or by the client, we're going to want to, you know, confirm that information. So we don't want to make sure that there, we want to make sure that there's no uh, miscommunication as to something as important as the, you know, contract price or the down payment amount or whether it's as is or not, uh, that kind of stuff, that pertinent information needs to be confirmed uh, and ironed out before you even draft the contract because otherwise you're drafting a contract that's just going to be, um, you know, tweaked initially from that, right? Yeah. Um, and in terms of the title report, 
where does that come from and how long does it take to, uh, to, to obtain and, and work out? So um, buyer um, will ordinarily want uh, what's called title insurance. Um, basically, it's an insurance company ensuring that the person selling them the property has good title so that they are able to sell that property to you. And um, it makes it so that if you have a situation where that person did not have good title to sell to you, you have some insurance against it. Um, now, what happens is usually when the contract is fully executed by both the seller and the buyer, the buyer's attorney will uh, ordinarily send the contract and order a title report and title insurance from a title company. Usually real estate attorneys have specific title companies that they work with uh, predominantly, so um, they're comfortable with them. Uh, now, the title report usually takes three to four weeks from order to be issued. Um, with COVID, it's been a little longer than that just because of uh, issues with uh, staffing uh, for the departments that they have to run searches for or even backlog. Um, but the title company will run searches with, as I said before, the town billings department, uh, the receiver of taxes. So they won't want to check that the taxes are all paid or uh, if they're open, there's no penalties on them or back taxes. Um, they'll run uh, judgment searches against you and or the seller and the buyer, the interested parties, uh, Patriot searches even. Um, so they'll, they'll run a, uh, a bunch of searches uh, and that will be compiled into a, a report that'll be issued to the buyer's attorney and the seller's attorney. Both the buyer's attorneys and seller's attorney will review the report and advise their client of any title issues and help to resolve them so that um, when we get to the closing table, uh, the title is clean and the title company has no issue uh, ensuring title uh, to the property. So just a couple of questions, who pays for the title report? So the buyer is the one who is ordering the title. So they ordinarily are the ones who will be paying uh, for the title report specifically. Um, there's usually an insurance premium um, and then certain charges that they run for the searches that they make. Okay. And if uh, there are issues with the title report, um, and there are typically provisions in a contract that allows you a little bit of time to, to resolve it, uh, or are you kind of, you know, in a, in a pickle if there's something that, that's going to take a little more time than what you have in the contract? Um, ordinarily, it'll be drafted so that there may be a certain amount of time that someone can extend the closing date in order to uh, resolve title issues. But you want to be clear um, with the attorney that, or the attorney should be clear with the uh, their client. Um, that such a provision needs to be uh, put in the contract and made right. clear. So that's another reason why it's, it's really important to have an understanding of if there's any issues that could come up and, and have a game plan on how to address them. Uh, if it, if it's, uh, you know, the spotlight is shown on that in a title report, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, what, what actually is done at closing? You hear constantly uh, going to closing. Uh, this will happen at closing. What, what is a closing and what could the seller expect? So the closing is uh, ordinarily where all of the, uh, where the deed and all of the transfer documents are signed. Uh, the seller's attorney and the buyer's attorney will, um, predominantly the seller's attorney will draft these closing documents. Um, if there is a mortgage, uh, the lender's attorney will have, and the bank will provide uh, bank documents as well that need to be signed uh, above and beyond the mortgage and the note. Um, that all parties have to sign at closing. Uh, the role of the attorney really at the closing table is to go through the documents with their client to make sure that they understand exactly what they're signing um, and to make sure that everything goes without a hitch or if there is a hitch that they can be there to resolve them and so that everybody uh, is happy at the end of the day, the buyer gets their house, the seller gets their money. Um, it's important also that the uh, attorneys uh, address uh, adjustments um, for taxes and um, possibly if there's a oil uh, in the property, uh, an oil tank measurement, um, and they just make sure all of these items are addressed prior to and at closing. When you say taxes, you mean uh, property tax payments like uh, real estate uh, taxes? Correct. So ordinarily, if you are closing within a tax period as a seller, um, if you've already paid taxes within that period, um, you are uh, entitled to a uh, reimbursement for the portion of those taxes that you are no longer in the prop own the property. Um, 
uh, vice versa, if you are closing in a tax period where you haven't paid taxes yet, they may not be due yet, or they are due but not without penalty, um, and you close, you alternatively, or turn, alternatively uh, will need to reimburse the buyer because they'll ordinarily pay those taxes at closing for the portion of the uh, taxes that uh, they were not in possession of the property. Sounds like it could get pretty complicated. <laughs> That's what you got attorneys for. Yeah, right. So, um, and then post-closing matters, what kind of post-closing things could come up? I mean, uh, you know, hopefully once you're, you're at closing, you're done with it, but I imagine there's some, some uh, loose ends that may need to be tied up. Tied up. Um, so uh, we already discussed uh, post-closing occupancy, uh, maybe an issue where you need, may need to stay in the property longer than the closing. Um, there's also uh, post-closing escrows. Um, if you, if the, a judgment may have not been paid on time, um, if the more, if a mortgage, if there's an ancient mortgage that may have not been satisfied and you, you know, you, you need to work towards getting that satisfied, but you want to close, um, sometimes the title company is willing to hold that money in escrow, uh, from the proceeds subject to you resolving those issues. One of the biggest ones we usually deal with, and it's not really big in, um, monetary wise, but it's just, uh, usually it's, uh, final water readings. Uh, sometimes, especially in the city, you can't get them by date of closing. So you may have to hold some money back um, until you get that reading to pay it off. Yeah, that is a common one is the water here, right? Um, all right, well, next slide, please. So just to kind of uh, summarize uh, how to avoid traps when selling your home, uh, we discussed what you should do before putting up the for sale sign. You know, you want to make sure that you have the proper documents in place, the co a copy of your deed. Uh, uh, if you're selling a co-op, your stock, original stock certificate, a proprietary note. You want to make sure that you have an understanding of any open permits or COs or any issues with title that may come up. This way you could approach, approach it strategically. Uh, and you want to make sure that you have uh, an experienced attorney lined up. You want to make a decision about whether you're dealing with a, a real estate broker uh, or, or selling it as is uh, on your own. Uh, and in terms of how you can avoid uh, your home sale from falling apart, as Josh, you know, so eloquently put it before, you, you there are some issues that will come up, and you need to be uh, um, aware of them. And like open permits, boundary line issues, any potential open mortgages, uh, and things you want to be familiar with uh, in the process. Wh what is the role of the attorney, uh, attorney in a real estate transaction? Uh, as we just discussed, it, it can get pretty complicated. You want to make sure that. Uh, you have a contract to sale that meets your needs and, and foresees potential issues uh, that may come up. You want to make sure that you have uh, an attorney who can uh, review the title report and advise you uh, accordingly as to any title issues and help you, you know, shepherd you through the process of clearing title. Uh, you want to make sure that your attorney can uh, represent you adequately at closing and is going to be available for any issues that may come up after closing. Uh, that would, you know, kind of get the, the deal done completely, so to speak. So next next slide. So I saw that we had uh, some questions uh, in the Q&A. Julie, I don't know if you want to review, uh, read them aloud and we can, uh, Josh, Tommaso, and I can, can address them. Sure. Barbara says, um, how can one check uh, their title for open permits or license, et cetera, prior to starting the selling process? Thank you for the question, Barbara. Um, Josh, Tommy, you wanna take a, a shot at this one? Um, so essentially um, before COVID, you could even go, you, everything comes from the town buildings department uh, where the property's uh, situated. So um, prior to COVID, I would say you could definitely just even yourself go down to the town buildings department and uh, request a copy of the file um, to see what they have on file. Um, at the very least, these days, um, you know, with, uh, you know, not being able necessarily to go in person, um, if you speak with your attorney in advance, they can get a title company to uh, request the file for obviously a, a, an amount of money, um, dependent upon that title company, uh, so that you can get a copy of what's on file and you can see if there's any open permits. Uh, if all the permits have been closed. Um, so that's a way that you can definitely uh, be proactive um, and just make sure that there's no permits. Now, 
Um, just because it's not showing any open permits, you know, you can run into a situation where um, a homeowner may have made changes themselves, never open a permit. So there could still be issues, um, even if an open permit doesn't show up. Um, I, I know, for example, I just spoke with a client recently where um, the homeowner, her father, put a, a, a wooden deck in the back. He converted the basement to a uh, to a living space by putting in a stove and and water uh, uh, sink, and then he converted the garage from uh, from a garage to living space, and he did all that on his own without opening a permit. So even if you see uh, you do make a search for any open permits with the town business department. If you know that um, someone made these changes and it's not showing, um, whether it's an open permit or a certificate completion showing that it's been approved by the town, um, you still may run into those issues. That's a, that's a great point. And a lot of the times the way that that is cross-referenced is by checking the public record. And sometimes you'll see a tip off if what's registered has for example, two bathrooms and you go to walk the property and now you see that there's three bathrooms there, and then obviously that that is an alarm that could get triggered. So just um, to piggyback off what Josh said. Uh, Tommy and Josh, if, if you see uh, violations and COs, uh, CO issues and permit issues, if you were to address an order of priority, what would you uh, try to tackle first if you're the seller? I'll let you take this one. Sorry. No, sure. Um, I would say COs are certainly going to be a, a, a big issue in terms of being able to address first and violations also. I mean, they're, 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 the two can be intricately twined as well. Yeah. So I would say that in, in order to be able to, do, to give title, you will have to have the COOs. Um, violations are usually uh, could be more minor in. Um, in, in their gravity. So I would say CO is first. So you could have a situation where uh, a lack of a CO or a lack of a permit could create a violation. Absolutely. Yeah, so you're right, they are intertwined. Uh, two question with regard to fees, in terms of um, attorney fees for real estate transactions, you know, I can't really speak to what's typical, but uh, you, you're gonna wanna be familiar with the, the experience uh, with the attorney uh, and the law firm with regard, and you have to understand your situation, uh, you know, that plays into legal fees always. So, you know, you just want to be upfront with the, the legal counsel, what their fees are, what, what could cause the fees to go up, uh, what would be, you know, is this a complicated matter, things like that. So um, in, in terms of in our firm, we deal a lot with um, sales of, of real property uh, and in particular from uh, trusts and estates. Now, Josh, when you're dealing with a sale from a trust and estate, is there any kind of scenario that, that's a little bit different than what you would in, encounter if you're selling it as an individual owner? Um, there may be additional documentation that you'll need to provide to uh, the buyer's title company. Um, you know, if you're selling it from an estate, um, they definitely will want to see uh, letters of appointment from the surrogates court. Um, so your Nassau, Suffolk, the Nassau County Surrogates Court, Suffolk County Surrogates Court, uh, if it's a will, it'd be letters testamentary in case of uh, somebody passes away without a will, it'd be letters of administration. Um, and those usually the title company will want um, dated within six months of the closing. Uh, so, you, you know, that's an issue. Um, if you are selling property uh, directly from the estate and it's not necessarily according to the will, sometimes but there is a good reason for that. You may have to petition the court for approval on that. So that could be another issue. Um, uh, you'd have to, if the, if you're selling property from an estate um, and it's what's called a taxable estate. So uh, it's uh, the value of the decedent's estate uh, is greater than the uh, New York state estate tax exemption. Um, the attorney may need to, will need to obtain what's called an, uh, release of lien from the New York State Tax Department, um, the form ET-117. So there's definitely documentation that needs to be filed with the New York State Tax Department in order for them to issue um, the ET-117. Um, even with uh, co-ops where you are selling the property and even if it's not a taxable estate, uh, cooperative uh, apartments usually require you to get them 
uh, from the uh, New York State Tax Department. Uh, so it's typically uh, something you'll run into with co-ops more so than regular residential or condominiums, but it's definitely something to be uh, cognizant of. So if you have a taxable estate in New York, you know, you're, you, the, the person passed away in 2021 and it, you have more than $5,900,000, you have to file that estate tax return in order to get the, the, the release of lien. Uh, that's actually a, a, not a question. That's a, a statement. I'm sorry. Well, that's a question. <laughs> so you, you're going to have to file uh, estate tax uh, returns and pay any tax liability before New York State will actually release a lien. But if you're under that limit, oftentimes you'll you'll be able to sign an affidavit at closing. But if the, if that's not possible, if the title company won't allow it, or as, as Josh mentioned, the uh, co-op will require, uh, you're going to have to get something from the uh, IRS and the state. Um, okay, so if we have any other questions, Julie, you may want to read them. Sure, we have a question from Paul. Um, if something on the property does not have a permit by the county, such as a shed, uh, the buyer is okay with it, can there be a problem? Um, so as long, I would say, it depends, no, if the buyer is okay with it, as long as you put it in the contracts ahead of time, so you make the attorney, your attorney aware of it and it's accounted for, basically stating that the buyer accepts the property subject to this open permit, then it shouldn't be an issue. Now, as we earlier discussed, um, if the buyer is getting a mortgage, um, if the open permit shows up, it could be an issue with the bank. Um, and they may not agree. <laughs> They're different than the buyer. They may not agree to fund the loan because of it. Um, if there's no open permit, and maybe it's something that was done without opening the permit. If it's not open and obvious, you may get away with it um, with the bank, but you, you're really, you know, you're gambling. Um, and if you decide not to take any action on it, you may run into a situation where at the last moment, the bank takes note of it and you're in a situation where you're scheduled to close, but you have to resolve this issue. So you trustees for a trust that has a home in it do all have to agree on the sale of the home. So that really depends on the terms of the trust. If the trust authorizes the trustees to uh, act independently, um, then it's possible that the, a trustee could, um, one trustee could uh, make a decision to sell the home and, uh, and that that transfer would be uh, uh, sufficient. If it doesn't, or if it's silent and it doesn't specifically say that, that the trustees could, could act independently of one another, uh, then you're gonna have to have uh, all fiduciaries, all trustees acting in unison. So just because you could do something though, is not something that you necessarily would recommend. So if, if there's you know, multiple trustees and, and one of them is interested in conveying the property or, or transferring it, and the others are interested in distributing it to the beneficiaries, that's something that you would want to resolve. And I, I do not think I would suggest getting into a, a sales situation um, without the, you know, the consent, uh, you know, at least uh, an understanding with the trustees uh, that you're going to sell this property because you're just kind of inviting litigation. Uh, but every situation is different and we definitely would, would review it, uh, you know, as it comes. So it's possible. Uh, Julie, you want to read Gina's question? Sure. Gina asks, how far in advance should you obtain and consult with your broker before you are ready to list the house? And what do you think, Tommy? I would say that that's really going to be based upon what your personal timeline is. Um, and also with the understanding that selling a home and also finding a home is going to take some time. So if you're looking to relocate, you might also need to be looking for a property simultaneously that might be contingent on you selling the house where you currently live. So given the fact that these things will take time, then it, you, it does not hurt to contact them sooner than later. Um, especially if you, if you are in that certain situation that I would always recommend on the earlier side, because you definitely want to understand the market, what your situation is and kind of what the timeline or what the expectation is that um, average days on market that you might be looking toward um, so I think that's really more of a, a personal question that you're, you would have to sit and, and, um, and discuss. Thank you. Um, so I, I think that's, that's our time. I, you wanna go to the next slide, I'm sorry. So if we didn't get to any questions, you wanna shoot us an email, we, we will uh, respond. 
So if, if you need help with a real estate transaction, please contact us for an appointment. We, we'd be delighted to hear from you. Let us know that you, know, you, you attended today's um, uh, webinar. And if you have any family member or a friend that can use our help, please, we would love a recommendation. That's the, the greatest compliment you can give to us. So Julie, what makes Russo Law Group different? Well, for starters, we have over 35 years of experience and over 150 years of combined professional experience focusing on elder law and estate planning. We also have office locations in Nassau and Suffolk counties, as well as in Manhattan. Um, you may wanna make sure you check out our, web our new website uh, where we share published articles, blogs, videos, uh, like this one today um, and other educational resources, uh, plus news and events that are happening at our firm. We also hope that you uh, can join us on April 22nd for our next webinar. Uh, it will be a hands-on and interactive presentation on what do you need to do before meeting with an estate planning attorney. Uh, you can keep an eye out for an email invitation and you could also share that with your family, friends, and colleagues. That's great. So we would love to hear from you guys. If you had any feedback uh, for today, that would be excellent. So have a great day and we hope to hear from you soon.